If you'll take your scripture passage and read it silently with me, Mark 4, 35 to 41. And uh, the title of it is, The Wind Ran Out of Breath. In the last seven years that I've been here, this is like the third or fourth time we've had this same scripture. And because it's in, the, it's in what's called the lectionary for reading on this particular day, but it's also one of the foundational scriptures about Jesus' life. And so every time we study it, we're in a different place in our life. And so that's the reason you wanna read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, underline it with red ink, then read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, underline it with green ink, then read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, underline it with blue ink, because every time you and I study about Jesus, we're in a different place mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Late that day, Jesus said to them, let's go across to the other side. They took him in the boat as he was. Other boats came along. A huge storm came up. Waves poured into the boat, threatening to sink it. And Jesus was in the stern, head on a pillow, sleeping. They roused him, saying, Teacher, is it nothing to you that we are going down? Awake now, he told them, he told the wind to calm down and said to the sea, Quiet, settle down. The wind ran out of breath. The sea became as smooth as glass. Jesus reprimanded the disciples. Why are you such cowards? Don't you have any faith at all? I worked at a lake for four years, all through high school. Uh, when the weather was good, we rented a lot of boats. So even during school, as soon as school was over, I'd go work at that lake, clean boats, uh, put gasoline in the motors, and get them ready for the next day. There's nothing stiller. It's almost scary when Lake Kachuma would be absolutely flat and there was no wind and it was dark at night. It was almost frightening. It was so still. This is pretty frightening to them when this huge storm all of a sudden went away and the sea was as smooth as glass. When that tremendous wind hit northeast Kansas, the day after that wind hit, I drove up towards Hiawatha and saw the two places that were on the front pages of our local newspaper. And I actually took pictures of them with my cell phone and sent them to the Horton Headlight newspaper because they, they don't have any reporters and they need all the help that they can get. The wind, this tremendous 80 mile an hour wind or whatever it was, took the roof off of a pretty well made tin building and scattered it across a pasture clear to the railroad tracks. Another older barn uh, was really blown apart uh, by that wind. The wind is tremendously powerful. Uh, if you've ever been in a squall, you know what a squall is. Uh, all of a sudden, there's just a tremendous force and what had been a fairly smooth sea becomes terrifying because the waves get really, really huge. One time I was on a large lake in Kansas that runs miles and miles from north to south, and when you get a real strong squall from the north, or from the south rather, there'll be waves five or six feet tall out in the middle of that lake, you think you're in the ocean. And uh, that's what happened to these disciples. One of the there's a bunch of subtitles in this scripture. One of them is, Jesus saved the life of his disciples. These were fishermen. They knew danger when they saw it. The boat was filling up with water. And uh, it's not that they couldn't swim. It's really hard to swim in a squall. Uh, 
I've been on water all my life, and it's terrifying to be in a squall. Uh, a little humorous story. Uh, I was on a NATO joint task force in the Atlantic Ocean with the 35th Division, and uh, a hurricane came. And we tried to outrun it. And even though we were on the edges of it, this, the USS Mount Whitney had been an aircraft carrier, so it was not a small ship. And they converted it to the command and control of all the Navy fleet in the Atlantic Ocean. And I don't know why they did this, but in a partial lull in that tremendous wind, they took an army general from the United States and got him in a helicopter and, and landed on the USS Mount Whitney. And I, I watched that helicopter land, and the wind was making that huge ship go like this. And so the helicopter pilot waited till it was up here and slapped that helicopter down. <laughs> I can't imagine what that general was thinking. Now, we had been on the ship for several days. And we, we were used to the storm. But the general came right off of dry land, right into a hurricane. After three days, we had to fly that general off because he was going to die from seasickness if, if we had kept him on that ship. This is the kind of storm that the disciples were in. I know it's a much smaller lake. They call it a sea. I'll tell you what, you can drown pretty quickly in any kind of water that's that wild. And, you know, many times I've read this, and I've not really read it like I read it this last week. Jesus physically saved their lives. Jesus has done that to you and me on numerous occasions. Most of the time we don't realize that Jesus kept that truck from running over us, kept that deer from jumping through our windshield, uh, preserved us in a dozen different ways, dozens of ways. Jesus physically saved his disciples. When we have this baptismal service on July 18th, it's an acknowledgement that Jesus physically saves us, spiritually saves us, mentally saves us, and emotionally saves us. One of the wonderful things about being a Christian is we don't have to fear death anymore. A friend of mine had real serious thyroid surgery. And he was speaking in Freedom Friday. And he said, you know, when I went in for that cancer surgery on my thyroid, I looked at it this way. And he's a wonderful Christian man. He said, if I died, it would be a, a win situation. And if I lived and was with God, it would be a win situation. You and I do not have to fear death. We shouldn't court with death but we shouldn't fear death. And, you know, I wanted to, this is Father's Day, and I want to share some stories. Jesus told a lot of stories. They call, they're called parables, but that word parable can be translated into English as story. My dad became a Christian in World War II. His life changed significantly. When he came home from Okinawa in the Pacific War, he was a different man. The first thing he did was join a Bible-believing church. This is in Salt Lake City. Everybody was Mormon, and there were, there were some Bible-believing churches, and he went around and found a church that really glorified Jesus. And they went on a church picnic in the Wasatch Mountains. 
I've, I've skied the Wasatch Mountains and they're absolutely beautiful. They're like the Sierra Nevadas or the Rocky Mountains. They're very tall and very beautiful. And they were around the campfire eating dinner and I was two and a half years old. I went out to explore. I've always been an explorer. But they didn't know where I was. Utah is a pretty dry straight state, but coming down out of the mountains there are irrigation, concrete lined irrigation channels for the crops down in the valleys. And I found one of those. And I was two and a half years old. This flowing water was interesting to me. The sides of the irrigation channel were like that steep. I walked down there in street shoes and reached down to touch the water and I heard my dad say, son, take my hand. My dad couldn't swim. <laughs> but he knew that I would drown if I fell in there. Two and a half years old. And I'll never forget that look. I remember clearly that incident, seeing the look of love and concern on my dad's face as he reached down and pulled me out of that really dangerous situation. That is what God does to us. God is constantly reaching down to you and me and pulling us out of difficult situations. I'd encourage you to keep a spiritual journey journal because I have, in my journal, I have list after list after list after list of where God has taken me out of emotionally dangerous times, psychologically dangerous times, spiritually dangerous times, and physically dangerous times. That's what Jesus did to the disciples here. They woke him up, they were terrified, water was pouring into the ship, and he said, how come you guys don't have faith in God? And he told the wind to calm down. And as soon as that happened, it was dead still. Now, like I shared earlier, I could deal with uh, heavy waves. Uh, I used to take an aluminum boat out. When I, when I had a half an hour off from work, I usually worked about 12 hours, 13 hours a day. But when they gave us a little time off, I would take an aluminum boat out with a three and a half horsepower engine and I would surf the waves in the middle of the lake. <laughs> and they'd be three or four foot waves. And if you catch, catch a wave right, it's just like you had a surfboard. But of course, the danger is you'll flip the boat, you know. But uh, I've been on water all my life and I, I would go out and surf the waves. But, but these were terrifying waves. And I could deal with the waves, but when I'd be in that boat dock totally alone at night, it was absolutely still, that was actually more terrifying to me than the biggest waves I had ever surfed, either on a surfboard or with those aluminum boats. Sometimes when God comes to you and me, his presence will be so real that you and I will be afraid of God. And so what I'd encourage you to do is listen to Jesus' words here. Why are you so afraid? Don't you have any faith at all? Sometimes stillness can be terrifying. I've been in certain meetings where some people are so anxious that when you're supposed to be quiet during the meeting, they're talking. Stillness can be very scary, but let me encourage you. If you really want the Spirit of God in your life, sometimes when you pray, don't say anything. Just visualize Jesus being with you and his Holy Spirit surrounding you with peace and stillness. You know, what Jesus wants of us in the storms of our lives is for us to have peace and stillness no matter what. It gets racked really to one of the things we mentioned earlier. 
Even people that love Jesus make blunders. They, we, we all have shortcomings. The secret is to ask God to forgive you and me, then forgive yourself, keep on loving and following Jesus, and loving and following other people. Virtually everybody that hears my words today, you have many good reasons for not following God. Christian people have treated you wrongly. Uh, you've treated other people wrongly. We all have feelings of shame and guilt. We have a dozens and dozens of reasons for not following God and for being still in God's presence. But there's a part of us that really, really wants peace and a part of us that really, really wants to love and be loved. Human beings cannot love us fully like we need to be loved. I don't care how wonderful your children are, your grandparents, your parents, your spouse. There's a deep need and hunger in all of us to be loved, and I mean to really be loved in a way that a spouse or children or parents or grandparents can't do. Surrender to that love. Surrender. You and I chasing every other kind of love will never be satisfied except to remind ourselves every morning, God loves me. I'm a child of God. I'm going to accept that love today. And part of your prayer time, just be absolutely still. And that love will come over you you don't have to be afraid of the stillness. That love will come over you and heal you. And I know you all have broken hearts. It will heal the corners of your broken hearts. When the disciples denied Jesus and ran away from him, with the exception of John, Jesus loved them and forgave them, and his love healed their broken hearts. Amen.